the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And in this is not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. I'd like to offer a memorial for all our persecuted brethren in the Middle East and in China uh, for their freedom and for their protection. Remember, O oh, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone would have fled without protection, and for thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I find to thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother, to thee I come. Sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word Incarnate, despise not thy petitions, but in thy mercy your parents are to me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening and greetings. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to the Center for Natural Law's first seminar in 2018. There are many parishes represented here tonight. Some of you are from Connecticut or Mary right here. There's a large contingent from our Lady of Mount Carmel who has been a good, faithful supporter of the Center for Natural Law's and I thank all of you. I know that some of you are from the Archdiocesan Biblical and Catechetical Schools. Welcome to you as well. Others are from parishes around the Denver metro area, some from Greeley, some from Colorado Springs, some from Parker. I met a gentleman from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Welcome to this country. So, from wherever you come, we are delighted that you're here at this very memorable event. <coughs> My name is Greg LaPointe. I'm the founder and director of the Center for Natural Law, which is now in its sixth year. I started the Center for Natural Law for one simple reason. Natural law is enormously important. The more one evaluates the contemporary challenges we face in this country and abroad, the more you can clearly see how increased knowledge of natural law and compliance with it is the roadmap to success. And so, the mission of the Center for Natural Law is to raise awareness of natural law, to explain the defendant, and then to advocate for the natural law. We accomplish this mission in different ways. We have individual parish, parish presentations, for example. We have an online distance learning program. We sponsor seminar events, such as this one tonight. We have our newsletter called The Gold Standard, which is complimentary. If you go to centerfornaturallaw.org, go to the activities page, scroll down, and you can sign up for free. You'll get each month a complimentary newsletter. I can att attest that virtually everyone here is a fan of our keynote speaker tonight. We have never, never had a speaker that has elicited so much excitement and enthusiasm. Just look at the crowd here tonight. It's wonderful. I would like to offer this another comment. I was the one who took the RSVPs over the last month. And uh, many of them came by way of email. Some of them, I'd say about 60 to 80, came by way of phone call. And I discovered something that there's a lot of creative ways to pronounce Father Ripper. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed to say, I probably mispronounced his name when I first met him tonight at the door. And I asked him, I said, how many people mispronounce your name? And he says, virtually everyone. <laughs> now, I do know some of you pronounce it correctly, because I've heard you pronounce it correctly. But there's a great number of us that do not know how to pronounce it. So I'd like to do Father Faber. Let me pronounce his name for you. It's Father Ripperger. Ripperger. Okay? All together. Father Ripperger. <laughs> Father secretly thanking me for that. <laughs> Tonight, Father Ripperger will speak on natural law. After his talk, we'll be about a seven minute break. Get a drink, go to the restroom. Then we will have questions and answers after that. And then we'll have a short comment, and then Father Hardy will give us a closing prayer. 
Now I'd like to introduce our speaker to you. Father Riverberg was born in Casper, Wyoming, to devout Catholic parents. After high school, he entered Conception Seminary College. He has received several degrees. He went to the University of San, San Francisco, and he received two bachelor's degrees, one in philosophy, one in, the, uh, one in theology. Then he received two master's degrees, one in theology from Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and one master's degree in philosophy from the Center of Thomistic Studies at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Then Father Riverberg went to the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, Italy, and he received two degrees there, a license in philosophy and a doctorate in philosophy. Father Riverberg has had several pastoral assignments. Starting in Omaha, Nebraska, he's been associate pastor at the Mackin Conception Church, as well as St. Patrick's Church. He was pastor at St. Joan of Arc Catholic Chapel in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. He has been a theology and a philosophy professor at different schools and for many, many years. Father Ripperger is an exorcist, something very few priests do, and something we don't know much about. He has written several books. Let me mention some to you. The Introduction to the Science of Mental Health, The Binding Force of Tradition, Topics on Tradition, Object of the Moral Act, Magisterial Authority. These books, these four books, happen to be for sale. The price list is right in front of the books on that front table over there. The check should be made out to, to Father Chad River. Deliverance and Prayer is available. Magisterial authority is available on the table, and there's only a few, so if you're interested, you might want to get over there and hurry. The metaphysics of evolution, and lastly, the binding force of tradition. Again, the price list is over there. Father Ripperger has, been, has authored more than 15 scholarly articles that have been published. So it is with great honor and a good deal of love. A privilege for me to introduce to you now, with your warm welcome, Father Chad Ripperger. This one, right? Yes. Okay. That's one of the best introductions I've ever had, Greg. I think I'll put you on the mark. So, here. Can you still hear me? Okay. I would like to thank Greg and the Center for the Natural Law for allowing me to actually come and talk and speak about the natural law. I decided to take the topic of the decline of the understanding of the natural law that's happened, uh, obviously, in recent years. But I want to talk um, a little bit first about the natural law, the structure of it. The second component will be then the um, what we're seeing in our culture, which is contrary to the natural law, which you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see, rocket scientist to see too much of that. And then I want to talk about uh, St. Thomas, what St. Thomas uh, gives as the causes of decline of the natural law inclinations, and then where that came from historically, so we can get a sense of where we've been and where we're at now. Okay. So the first part is going to be philosophical, so you'll have to forgive me having a doctrine. I'll hopefully make it somewhat approachable. St. Thomas says that the natural law is an ordinance of reason that God places in us by which we are inclined towards certain kinds of activity. What does that mean? Well, he says basically, the nat when you break down the two words natural and law, nature is the essence of a thing, what a thing is. So a dog has a different essence than an ape, than a human being, etc. So they're essentially different things. And that essence, each essence, inclines that particular kind of being to perform specific kinds of activities. So for example, a dog is designed by its nature to bark and bite and eat, etc. The whereas a human being is by its nature designed to enter into rational discourse, living community, etc., which we'll see here in a minute. So that's those are the, the natures in clients to go doing different things. Okay. So that's the natural part of it. 
The law part of it indicates that there is a legal aspect to it in a certain sense. By legal, we mean in relationship to God, who is its author. Okay. So the natural law, in that sense, so if you if you define law, so that's the first thing we have to do. A law is a promulgated ordinance of reason by which he who had by which he who has care of the community. Uh, um, it's an ordinance of reason by which he who has care of the community for the sake of the community. Now I want to break that down a little bit. The efficient cause. So if you look at Aristotle, Aristotle had four efficient, uh, four different causes. The first is the material cause. That's something that something is out which something is made. So we see that the statue is made out of bronze. So the bronze is the material cause of the thing, because without the bronze, the thing wouldn't exist. The second is the formal cause. That's the structure or the shape or the, the nature that's in the thing that makes that matter be, say, a statue of, of um, St. Lucy as opposed to a statue of St. Thomas. So it's that form that's given to it, so that's the formal cause. The efficient cause is the thing that brings about the thing's existence. So the artist is the one who takes the bronze, forms it into the statue of St. Thomas, and then, he, so he makes it be the statue of St. Thomas. The final cause is the reason why he did it. So the final cause is why he do it. Well, he might have done it because he wants it to produce a beautiful statue because he has a devotion to St. Thomas. Or he might have done it because he simply got to pay the bills. Right? So there can be a variety of different reasons as to why he actually does that. Okay. In law, it's, when it's promulgated, that it actually, that's the, it's the promulgation by the person who has the care of the community. It's the promulgation, it's the efficient cause. It's what brings the thing into existence. This is a very important point, because in civil law, if they don't promulgate it, it's not law in the mind of St. Thomas. So the fact that in this country, they've been promulgated, that they've been passing laws, but not making them publicly known, which is the promulgation process, means that, morally speaking, they can have no binding force over the citizenry. This is a key point to keep in mind. Of course, the civil law doesn't follow the natural law, which we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. So it's promulgated, then it's an ordinance of reason. Now, an ordinance means that it directs or guides behavior and activity towards a particular end. So, the ordinance of reason, when God gives us the natural law, that means he places in us a direction or a guidance towards specific kinds of behavior and avoidance of other kinds of behavior. He specifically structures us that way. We're structured to know the truth, to speak the truth. We're structured to actually live in community, to live to actually have politics, although it should be a little bit better than what we're experiencing. We're actually designed to have children etc. And so these, this is the ordinance that he places in us. It's a direction, it's an inclination towards specific kinds of behavior and things. Like he who has care of the community, in this case the natural law is, it's God. It's God who has care of the community. And it's for the sake of the community. So God gives us the natural law for our benefit. So if you read the Summa Contra Gentiles of St. Thomas, he actually argues to the Ten Commandments based purely by the natural light of reason, and that in his mind, the Ten Commandments are merely an explication of the natural law. You don't need, it's technically speaking, purely a philosopher can recognize the truth of the Ten Commandments based on the natural law without any appeal to reveal the religion whatsoever, which is contrary to what most Protestants think, which tend, which if we were living in a Protestant culture, they think that any mention of the Ten Commandments is de facto religious. That's completely false. You can actually discuss the entire contents of the, 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 uh, the Ten Commandments without any uh, reference to uh, where it was put in the Old Testament. You don't have to do that. Okay. So this inclination that God gives us, St. Thomas breaks down into three categories of natural inclination. Three categories. The first is 
the inclination towards preserving your being as it is. The way we know this is that God placed in us a natural inclination for self-protection. If someone holds your fingers out and want to chop them off, what's your instinctive reaction to pull away from it? Okay. So we know that we want to be preserved as we are. Interestingly, I was just reading his discussion about the natural law of the angels. And he said the demons actually fell because they still wanted to preserve their nature as it was, but they wanted something higher, some property that was above their nature. And that's why they fell as wanting that thing as opposed to wanting the will of God. The next, the second category is those things which we have in common with other animals. And this principally has to do with uh, principally has to do with uh, the having and rearing of children, primarily. It also has to do with eating and things of that sort. But primarily, that's, when St. Thomas talks about it, he talks about it in the context of um, having and rearing children. So there's a structure that God built into the natural law towards how we, how we have children. It's not just that we have children. It's there's a specific structure that we see in human beings in our nature that determines how that's supposed to come about. It's very interesting because when Pope John Paul II wrote uh, Very Taught His Splendor, he said the church takes the Thomistic teaching of the natural law into its own. Now that's a very formal way of saying two things. One is that Thomism, the Thomistic understanding of the natural law, is the foundation for the church's teaching on natural law. The second component is, is that the church's understanding of the natural law is actually broader, more developed than St. Thomas. After St. Thomas, some of the saints continue to develop in a discussion of it, such as St. Alphonsus Liguri, the church herself, and dealing with things like in vitro fertilization, contraception, things of this sort, has all been developed off of that. And you don't see some of that, I mean, obviously you're not going to see discussions of in vitro fertilization in the Summa, because that was 700 years ago. So the church actually has a broader understanding of it, or, or not broader, but a, a deeper and more developed understanding of it. The category of inclination is that which is proper to the life of reason. And this is the part that I think is probably taking the most hit in our culture. But this, uh, those things that are proper to the life of reason is those things I mentioned, like politics, education, um, being able to sit down and pursue the truth, desire to know the truth, these are very specific things that God places in us in relationship to it. So, if you look at our culture, uh, we see something a little bit different, obviously. Gay marriage. Gay marriage is against the second category of natural inclination. Why? Because marriage, by its nature, is ordered towards having children. Gay people can't have children. Second of all, it's also contrary to the of those things that are proper to the life of reason. When people are acting in ways that's contrary to nature, it has an effect on us intellectually and psychologically, even when we're living around it. Abortion. One of my theories is, is that when a woman has an abortion, in fact, there's a book called Aborted Women Sought Up No More by Reardon, and in there he does a study of women who have had abortions. And what he discovered was, is that the more flippant the woman was in having the abortion, the less psychological damage there was. But the more she thought about it and agonized in it, the more psychological damage was actually caused as a result of it. But what that tells us is, is that for a woman to want to bring her child to term is so part of her nature that if she has an abortion, it literally short circuits her psychologically because her whole being is ordered towards caring and nurturing of that thing, as well as being seen to be a different vision, but that's just completely short-circuited. The relationship, this is interesting, historically the relationship that the Supreme Court in this country has had to the natural law has been in and out. There are certain times in which they would adjudicate certain things that basically were based on the natural law, and then other times they would completely separate it and basically say the will of the people is the foundation for the civil law. And they would go back and forth until about 1950. In 1950, there was a clear break from the natural law. And it primarily had to do with two things, the anti-fornication laws and the anti-contraception laws. Contraception, you have to remember, among the Protestants collapsed in 1932 with the Lambert Conference. So when that collapsed, 
It was just a matter of time before it spread into the legal system here. This is also due to the Hobbes and Lockean theory of politics and law, which we're not going to go into. But it had to do with a, a, a false understanding of the relationship of civil law to, to human beings, ultimately, and whether it has to be based on the natural law or not. Most, even most uh, Supreme Court justices, even the best of them, don't believe that the, that the civil law has to be founded on the natural law. The resurgence of socialism and communism in the education system and politics. Literally, people talk to me and I just say, you know, some of these young kids literally cannot follow a syllogism. If you say all A or B and all B or C, therefore all A or C, they look at you like, how did you get that? Literally. And it's because, as Bella Dodd says in her book, School of Darkness, she lays the whole thing out. The communists essentially took over the educational systems and the political systems in this country in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So it was already done. And so now what we're seeing is, is that the communism is, is dumbing them down, essentially, in relationship to that. So the natural law in uh, taking the, the, just the, prop, the attitude of people, uh, like Luke 13 says, he says, we have a natural life, law right to property, to own things. We have that right. Well, one of the things that's happened is, is now you see as the kids are coming up, they see nothing wrong with re wealth redistribution. Oh, we get to take from whoever and give it to whoever we please. There's no concept of the, the, the natural law concept of, no, this person has a right to that, to that ownership of that thing. And they see no problem with it. Then a general acceptance of women having children out of wedlock. St. Thomas says that the reason that you have to have both parents uh, and this is putting aside the fact that the father might die or what have you, but he said the, the, the reason you have to have both parents is because it's necessary to have both parents in order to raise the child adequately. And we know this. We just see this all the time with children. Uh, one psychologist that I was talking to one time said that the, uh, this was shortly after the Columbine shooting. And they, she did research on all these mass shooters that are going into schools and mowing people down. And she said there was only one thing they had in common. She said, even though it's coming out more and more, a lot of these people are on psychotropic drugs, she said that the primary thing they had in common is they all went to daycare. Now what's interesting is, is that the psychologists know that in daycare, if the child doesn't receive proper emotional bonding, with the mother or with somebody, it causes disaffective disorder, which is basically where the children can't have an emotional connection with people. This tells you that God built into both women and into children that bonding process that has to happen within the first three to five years. Okay. The general acceptance of people living together before marriage. Oh, by the way, 57% of parents ages 26 to 31 in this country are now having children out of wedlock. They're not even having marriage. What's interesting is St. Thomas, we'll talk about this later, he says there's second, certain, certain kind of secondary precepts which everybody knows and there's no excuse. So if you engage in this activity, you have no excuse for being penalized for it. And the example he gives is fornication. Interesting. Because he considered the fact that it had to occur, that the conjugal act had to occur within the context of marriage to be such a part of it, part of the natural law that nobody had an excuse. No fault divorce. The natural law actually tells us that the marriage bond has to be permanent and exclusive for the whole duration of their life. The fact that this, in this country we have no fault divorce is a gargantuan problem. The rapid immodesty. Women have a greater inclination to modesty than men, and yet women are dressing worse than the men now. It's a serious issue. Breaking down in Europe. In Sweden, it was just adjudicated that when Sharia law is in place, it is okay for the husband to beat his wife. Now, the natural law says, no, his job is to protect and provide for her, not to beat her. The fact that what they used to call the vitia contra natura, those are devices contrary to nature, are now considered perfectly acceptable. Those are things like sodomy, masturbation, and the like. All these sins that are contrary to human nature are now perfectly accepted. In fact, 
I'm sure you've been paying attention, or maybe haven't, and you're blessed that you aren't. But there's a growing pressure to drop the age of consent in relationship to those matters in order to engage in hemophilia and pedophilia. There's a huge push in that direction. The DSM-3, when they came out with the DSM-3, which is the Di uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that the psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose people, when they came out with that, before they came out with it, the homosexuals gained control over the mechanisms and the process by which that was put together, and they managed to get homosexuality removed out of it as a form of mental illness. The reason they did that is because you can't have gay marriage if the psychologists are saying it's an aberration. They are now doing that with pedophilia. They're working very hard to get it out of the next DSM. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, it means that there's obviously been a complete, not a complete, I shouldn't say that, there's been a substantial eclipse of the natural law in the minds of people, how they actually understand it. And so we want to talk about how does this happen? St. Thomas in his Prima Secundae, question 94, uh, article 6, actually parses out two things that I think are really key to understanding how this happens. He says, first, it pertains to the natural law, certain common precepts, which are known by all. Okay, now those common precepts are do good and avoid evil. Everybody knows you're supposed to do good and avoid evil. As long as you have use of reason, you know you're supposed to do good and avoid evil, right? And every human being knows that, because God creates that in our mind to recognize that, and then we have, to, we have, we have that inclination to do that. Doesn't mean we don't sin, but we still have that inclination towards doing good and avoiding evil. Interestingly, in his earlier works, in the uh, commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences, he says that one of the things he lists in that text as being a common, one of those common precepts that everybody knows and understands, and that as long as you have the use of reason, you would know this, is that God is to be obeyed. Interestingly, in his latter works, it's not there. Now, I don't know if he changed his mind about it or if he just left it out by oversight. He says, moreover, secondary precepts are more proper, which are as if conclusions to neighboring principles. What does that mean? It's one thing to say, do good and avoid evil, and it's immoral to commit theft. So the, it's immoral to commit theft is a secondary precept. Thou shalt not steal is a secondary precept. Okay. So you, as long as you have use of reason, you're incapable of appearing about the primary precepts. Do good and avoid evil. But when it comes to the secondary precepts, there's actually two kinds. He says, therefore, so far as to the common principles, that is, to the uh, first principles, the natural law in no way is able to be deleted from the heart of man in general. In other words, it's impossible, as long as a person has use of reason, for them to get to the point where they actually think it's okay to do evil. Now, they might think, I think it's okay to do evil, but what they really call evil is what they consider the good. Okay. Natural law is deleted in particular actions, insofar as reason is impeded to applying the common principles in a particular action. What does this mean? It means that intellectually we have a formation that we know that you're supposed to do good and avoid evil. We're supposed to be good people. As Christ said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We actually have a natural inclination to perfection. This is one of the things that we have. As a result of that, to go from that though, to know that, you know, I should, you know, I shouldn't steal my neighbor's property, or I shouldn't be killing people, etc. So he says, those, he says, because of concupiscence or some other passion. They can be impeded. What does that mean? Well, if you look at the Secunda Secundi question 153, he says this. He says, the person knows that fornication is immoral. He knows it's immoral. But then, I use the example, Bessie Sue, father will get the charge out of this one because he's set my classes. Bessie Sue walks in and she's ravishingly beautiful. And then what happens is, is his passions arise up and it affects his judgment, and then he thinks that fornication is okay in this instance. Then, but he keeps doing it. And over the course of time, he starts to develop an intellectual habit of judging that it's okay to commit fornication, so that eventually he thinks it's okay in general. 
This is exactly what happened in our culture from the 50s up through the 70s, where at first they knew it was immoral in the 50s. We know this from various writings and people talking about it, that the amount of fornication started to drastically rise. It was a cult. People didn't know much about it. But it was starting to occur. Then in the 60s it becomes full blown, and before it's all over with now, the common conventional wisdom is you should live together before you get married, right? Which of course they know that that's bad because 80% of those relationships end up default, uh, separating anyway. But the point being is, is that through a series of passions and bad judgments, eventually that natural inclination intellectually to see that fornication is immoral eventually becomes it's okay. So leading the passion life, committing lots of sins over the course of time will start to eclipse the natural law inclination of the revulsion we have towards those things that are evil. We will start to slowly decline and eventually be eclipsed. Okay. He says, truly so far as to the other secondary principles, the natural law is able to be deleted from man's heart either because of bad persuasions, which happen by way of speculative errors about necessary conclusions or by depraved customs and corrupt habits. What does that mean? It means that if you take your child and place him under an educator who does not believe that what the, in the natural law and teaches things contrary, over the course of time, he will convince the child through, again, a series of intellectual habits, thinking about things, and so he's inclined to judge things a certain way. Eventually, through this persuasion, he will think it's, it's okay to live together. It's okay to murder your child through abortion. You know, it's, it's, it's okay to steal other people's property. So that eventually, through, so one is sin and the passions and appetites. The other one is through bad intellectual formation that results in your not being able to see what the truth is about the natural law. Okay. So those are the two areas I want to talk about in this conference to, to round it out. So the speculative areas about necessary conclusions and craved customs and habits. Okay, first, how do the customs collapse? Uh, what we need to do is we need to talk a little bit about philosophy. Everyone's like, I thought I came to hear comments about natural law. After St. Thomas wrote the natural law in, in his Prima Secunde, which he very, wrote very little about the natural law, by the way, but it became the foundation course known to a large amount of the the uh, theological work of the saints after that. But one of the things that, so after, right after St. Thomas, historically there was a philosophical movement called nominalism. And what nominalism uh, resulted in, it was basically based on some kind of skepticism. People started doubting that you really know anything. I can't know the nature of a cow, I can't know the nature of a dog, I can't know the nature of a human being. Therefore, because I can't know what this thing is, I'm just going to assign a name to it, which is from the Latin word nomen. That's where we get nominalism from. I'm going to just assign a name to it. So out of skepticism, they stopped thinking that you could actually know the nature or essence of a thing. That was the first break that happens in the natural law. Why? Because the natural law is that, in least, at least in relationship to human beings, we have a nature. We understand what that nature is. We understand the essence of human beings, and therefore we can see what God is inclining us to in that nature. Okay. So the first thing is, is that the natural law stuff gets, uh, the, the nature gets questioned. And the skepticism ultimately comes as a form of doubt, so they just don't believe you can know any of this. Then comes along Descartes. Now Descartes had good intentions, but very bad philosophy. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to give philosophy as a grounding in which the certitude in philosophy would be the same kind of certitude we have in mathematics. I mean, two plus two equals four, we have absolute certitude about that. We wanted that same kind of thing in philosophy. But what he did actually started a whole series of problems, him and one other guy, which we'll talk about in a minute. What he said is if you take a stick and you stick it in the water, it bends, or it looks like it bends. Now, I know it doesn't bend, because I pull it out and it has a bend, but it goes in there and it bends. As a result of that, I can't trust what my senses are telling me. As a result of that, the only way I can have certitude about anything is I have to start internally in myself and my own thoughts. 
And that's where he came up with, I think, therefore I am. I cannot deny that. I can't doubt that. So from there, he thought he could build the process. Later down the road, then what he does is, is he says, but God, so he reasons to God's existence. He says, but God is so good, he would never deceive us, and therefore our senses do tell us what's the truth. Okay, true problems. Well, we already know that refraction of light causes that. So it doesn't have anything to do with doubting the senses. The second thing is, is it's a philosophical principle. You can't deny the conclusion, which you've denied in the premise. Or you can, sorry, yeah. You have to deny the conclusion which you've denied in the premise. You can't assert the conclusion which you've denied in the premise. What's that mean? If I say I can't trust my senses at the beginning of my argument, I can't at the end of my argument say I can trust my senses because you're contradicting yourself. This is what Kant ended up saying. Kant said, that doesn't work. Descartes' argument doesn't work. Now mind you, what's happening is in philosophy, we're becoming more and more disconnected from reality, knowing the nature of things. Because how do we know the nature of a thing? By looking at it in reality. And so there's this disconnect that starts to happen. Then, it come, uh, then along comes Hume. And Hume did something that caused a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, and it's a very facile problem, but he, he did it anyway. And basically what Hume said was this. Hume says, when you, if you look at a billiard ball on a, on a pool table, one ball comes up, it hits the other ball, and it goes off, right? Now, in our mind, we think that the energy or the inertia is transferred from one ball to the other ball, and that's how that ball starts moving. But what he, what he says is, he says, you don't know that. That's what your senses see. But you don't, you don't actually feel or experience the physical force being transferred. And as a result of that, he came up with this theory of constant conjunction, where one ball comes up, and the other one just starts moving. And so he said, there's nothing that can say that out of the blue, this ball would just start moving. Okay. It's a very easy, that's a very easy problem to solve, right? And it's basically based on the principle of sufficient reason. You can't give what you don't have. The ball can't start moving if it isn't already in motion or doesn't receive the motion from something else, right? But once he did that, and this is where it gets, it becomes a problem, Kant, who comes along later, looks at that theory of constant conjunction, and that means that my, the external reality, which he called the noumena, Kant called the noumena, it may or may not be the cause of what my experience is internally, because there's no causation. There's just this constant conjunction. That meant that after Hume's critique of, because how do we know things? We have a sense of experience. It's caused in my senses. It gets to my brain. My brain processes it. My intellect makes a judgment about it, etc. So I actually come to knowledge about reality through my senses. But that means there has to be causation. If you, which, if you accept Hume's critique of causation, I don't know if these, this, the, what I'm feeling in my senses is in fact caused by something outside. Now, any normal human being, when they first hear that, their first reaction is, we put people in rubber rooms for this kind of thinking. <laughs> Literally. Today, we really, we have, I mean, millions of people should have sued just saying, well, wait a minute, you guys are glorifying Kant and Hume and Descartes, but all I'm doing is living it. Right? Okay. But the point being is, is that that meant that we're cut off from reality. That meant that the nature of things was inaccessible, and therefore the natural law theory from Kant on completely collapsed in the mind of the philosophers, except for the Thomas and the Catholic Church. Kant do is we still have to, have, we have to tell people something about how to act moral. So he came up with what he called the categorical imperative. He said, act only according to the maximum whereby you can, at the same time, will that it would become a universal law. In other words, act in such a way that everybody else, you would want everybody else to act that way to become a universal law. Do you see what's happened? The objective content of the moral law, which we know through the natural law, which we know in reality, has been transposed from reality to an internal standard. It's now me, what I think is the right thing, what I think everybody should do, rather than objective reality. Okay. Then comes along a guy by the name of Schleiermacher. I always liked that term. I always wanted to use it for something like, I think you have a problem with Schleiermacher. <laughs> anyway. Schleiermacher 
then once you're cut off from reality, then their other problem is, is proof for the existence of God, knowledge about revelation, all that collapse. So Schleiermacher, in trying to get religion off the ground, then says, he says, piety and religion are found in the emotions. He said, piety is pure emotion. Pure emotion. Now we're all seeing this, even in the Catholic Church. And so as a result of that, once you get cut off from reality, your religious practices, even your code of conduct, which flows from your religious practices, is all going to be based on your emotions. Okay. Rather than what? The object of contract to which I must adhere because of the natural law. Then Blondell comes along. He says, modern thought considers the notion of eminence as the very condition of philosophizing. He says, it is, it, it is the idea, which is perfectly true, that nothing can enter into man's mind which does not come out of him, correspond in some way to a need for expansion. And there is nothing in the nature of historical, traditional teaching or obligation imposed from without that counts for him. What did he just get done saying? After this whole epistemological collapse in relationship to, we're seeing this with the natural law, then what happens is, as this whole thing collapses, it also collapses in the area of religion. It collapses in virtually every single intellectual area. And as a result of that, once that happens, then the individual, taking it from Kant, the individual becomes the foundation for what they judge to be true. Let me give you an example of how this is rife. One of the things that the Congress did in this country in the educational systems is they would say things like this. Johnny, 2 plus 2 equals 4. How do you feel about that, Johnny? And what they were trying to do is make the connection in Johnny's mind that something is true if he has a positive emotional experience in relationship to it. If he doesn't have a positive emotional relational experience to it, then it is not true. And we're seeing this all over the case in our society. If something, if I don't have a good emotion in relationship to it, it's just not true. And this is one of the reasons why they really, that's why when you start reasoning with them, if they don't have an emotional response, they don't know how to think in relationship to it. Okay. From this point on, the criteria for what is morally right and wrong has made a complete philosophical switch from objective to reality known in the natural law to a purely subjective criteria, which in the end is only about emotion. That's where we're at today. This also coincides with the Protestant Revolution, in which there was no intellectual foundation on a realistic perennial philosophy, that is a philosophy that is, is good regardless of the age or time, and uh, undergirding and providing a foundation for the theology. So this whole thing comes along. Now, what happens with us? So the grave customs and the, and the customs, the legal systems, the laws, Everything that's being founded in relationship even to the United States but worldwide, all our customs then, it takes a little bit of time, and eventually the philosophy takes over. And then it gets into the customs, into the culture. And this is where we're seeing, this is why it's so eclipsed, just on the level of persuasion. If you just ask the average man on the street, do you believe the truth is, is uh, objective? Most people would say no today. That means that literally by persuasion, the natural inclination to recognize that I know something is true because what I think adheres to what's in reality, that's the definition of truth, which is the adequation of intellect to thing, which means what, that what's in my mind is actually in reality. In other words, when I see something in reality, that it's in my mind. So if I think that the grass is purple outside, I don't know the truth. But today, Someone will say, well, that might be your truth if you feel like the grass should be purple, right? You see where this is all happening. You can also see why it's just a prescription for mental illness, because mental health is when we act according to the way God designed us, according to the natural law. And when our brain and our intellect don't function that way, we're mentally ill. And this is why, this is why, I don't know if you saw it, but they actually came out and they said that they think somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of the adult population in the United States is mentally ill. It's all part of the persuasion process. 
Okay, but then you have something else later on top of that. So St. Thomas says that persuasion, that's persuasion, that intellectual formation. The other one is sin. Okay. Once the collapse in philosophy occurred, it led to a collapse in morals. That's basically what happened historically. If you look at the Protestant legal system, such as in the United States, as well as general Protestant moral theology, it collapsed at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. The collapse was happening then. They had no way to keep the bad philosophy from affecting the moral collapse, whereas the Catholic Church had the authority of the magisterium. That's how we survived. It's once it was capitulated by a particular pope who said, we will not please the doctrinal integrity of what's said at the council. From that point on, we've had nothing to trouble. Okay. This is why the Lambert Conference in 1930, the Anglicans approved birth control under certain circumstances, and the other Protestant sects, generally speaking, uh, followed suit shortly after that. The collapse of the natural law in the Catholic Church, though, happened in a very different fashion. I actually wrote an article once called uh, Operative Points of View. And basically in that article, I talk about the fact that if you look at the history of modernism in the Catholic Church, there's a series of stages in which certain things happen. And during one of those stages, the underground phase, during the underground phase, which happened about the 19 teens to about 1940, during that phase, what happened was is that the modernists who were being purged by Pius X, Benedict XV stops the purging. Then, as a result of that, the modernists get into the academics in seminaries and in educational institutions in the Catholic Church. Once they got in, they started changing this. Now, mind you, the modernists, this whole thing I talked about Kant and Hume and all these guys, they had bought that hook, line, and sinker. So the intelligentsia had already collapsed by that time in relationship to the natural law. But you couldn't get a moral manual published without getting the imprimatur. That means you have to pay at least lip service to the natural law, but it starts to erode. In the 1950s, is the first time you begin to see in the uh, natural law discussion, although there was some indication of it a little bit before, in 1932, theologians sent a question to the Holy Office and asked this question. They said, is it permissible, and I hate to say this, but it's something I think we need to think about and deal with, is it permissible because we're actually hearing it, Catholic theologians say it's perfectly acceptable. They said, is it permissible for a husband to commit small sodomy with his wife. They already knew the answer because St. Uh, Thomas and St. Alphonsus had put an end to the discussion, completely laid the whole thing out. But they came back, signing off on the theological language of St. Augustine, or St. Alphonsus and St. Thomas, and said no, because it's a vice contrary to nature, and that a wife has to be willing to go to her death before she's willing to allow that to happen. To her death, they said. This is in 1932. By the 1950s, moral manuals are already collapsing in that very area where they're starting to be put out where it might be acceptable under certain circumstances, etc. So by the 1950s, the modernism had influenced the Catholic thinking, and as a result of that, there was a collapse in people's understanding of the natural law, even within the church. This is why the moral manuals in the 60s and 70s were completely out to lunch the natural law at all. During World War II, there was a collapse of morality. Uh, if you want to listen to it, I'm a bit harsh on them, but as I get older, I'm getting even harsher, I suppose. But the, uh, the, what they call the, quote, the greatest generation, unquote, I, I, in my comments, I, uh, that I, it's called uh, the sixth generation. In there, I talk about the fact that the greatest generation was already sleeping together. Not entirely, probably not the majority of it, but the morals had already collapsed when they came back from World War II. In fact, that's one of the dangers of war. War always, uh, in, in most cases, war causes tremendous damage on the morality of the soldiers and the citizenry. That's a, because people are in survival mode. But anyway, there's this collapse. But it was hidden because it was socially unacceptable. Notice, they did not put an end to the hippie generations openly sleeping together. The British generation let it happen. 
They could have shut the whole thing down, but they didn't. They just stood by there and let it happen. And the natural law roles in marriage collapsed during the war. Now part of it was because of the war effort. During the war, women had to go to work in, in the factories, and as a result, they started liking the fact that they had this financial independence of their husband. And so the greatest generation, if you ever looked at the husband and wife relationship, the people who were the greatest generation, the, uh, the, the husband was just usually the nicest guy on the planet. The wife just had absolutely no use for him whatsoever, right? By the time it was all said and done. But that's that collapse of the family structure that the natural law actually dictates collapsed at, during the war and when they started having children in the 50s and 60s, that's when all that collapsed. But now, you know, most families that I've seen of these younger kids are matriarchies. They're not, you know, they're not the husband. And, and even when the guy wants to do it, the notion of masculinity has collapsed because, again, masculinity is part of the natural law. It has collapsed to such a degree, guys don't even know what it means to be a man. Right? They, don't, they don't even know what it means. Okay. Once fornication is considered socially acceptable, then the pleasure principle is simply unpacked over the course of time within the society. If sex is about pleasure, then that means ultimately uh, anything goes. If I love the person, back to the emotions, the emotions are the standard. If I love the person, then it's okay. Right? And so this is what we're actually seeing in relationship to the totality of our culture. So as the sin started to multiply, this problem of people, like I mentioned in St. Thomas, in question 153, fornication is immoral, eventually it becomes okay, and now it's, it should be the norm. People should be living together before. In fact, if I remember right, the statistic was is that 85% of people thought that living together before marriage was, so, was morally acceptable, uh, but 87% actually do. So you're, you're talking about a, a, a drastic change. Once the, the sin set in, and then once the bad formation happened, the natural inclinations to the natural law collapsed. This is why, I mean, we've been talking about fornication, but this is also one of the reasons why just the first category of natural inclination, preserve your being as it is, people are tattooing and piercing themselves like it's going out of style. Tattooing was always considered in the moral manuals a form of mutilation. The second of I've always said, you know, why don't you want to get a tattoo when you're 18? Because when you're throughout, you know, 50 or 70, you're not even going to be able to recognize the thing. Although I did come up with a theory about patent uh, too, but I don't go into that. Um, the second, the, the other thing is too is, is that in relationship to living in culture and in society, we're starting to see now, especially in this society, our culture in the United States that it's acceptable to bludgeon people who, uh, you know, that basically it's okay to verbally and physically bludgeon people to shut them up if they have a counter position to yours, right? People can't even live with basic justice in mind anymore. And that, again, you know, every time you turn around, the Supreme Court is adjudicating stuff completely divorced from the natural law. So essentially speaking, it's these two things that came together that resulted in uh, reason why reason the reason why natural law is so occluded or clouded in people's minds because they're so sinful. It's basically that way, and so we have developed contrary intellectual habits of thinking. Sin and modern philosophical errors have also contributed to the whole problem. You see that particularly in the church. The bishops, although by the grace of God we've got a decent one here, but by and large, the bishops, the by and large, they're more worried about the finances and hurting people's feelings than they are proclaiming the truth of the Catholic Church. And that's just in charity. True charity, if you really love somebody, you want them to be able to function the way God designed them, because when we function contrary to the way that God designed us, or when we act contrary to the natural law, it causes damage. And it causes us to be unhappy, but people don't seem to, to seem to get it. So, to conclude this, at least initially, we have these natural inclinations. We have this structure. It might become closed or occluded, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's still there. St. Thomas asks, can it be revivified? In a certain sense, yes, it can. 
if people start leading a natural, normal life, then their head starts to clear and they're able to see and the natural inclinations can then begin again. But this requires virtue, which is completely vacant from the educational discussion in our culture. So then people say, well, Father, this is all bad news. Can you tell us something positive? Well, the positive part is the natural law does not change. Human beings don't change. You know, one of the things they said is, you know, we need to embrace the modern world. Let's just take the word modern out of that, and that's really what's happening. Let's embrace the world, which, of course, every saint guarded against. It's right in Scripture. St. Paul says, guard yourselves from this age, this world. Okay. But there's also a, uh, another component to it, too, which is basically that so, the working on the virtues and just rebuilding those and making sure that you're teaching them to your children is the way to rebuild the understanding of the natural law in the minds of people. Once that happens, then society will begin to function rightly and people won't be so messed up. I mean, literally, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you look at, you look watching people on the news, some of the stuff's coming out of their mouths are like, that is irrational. And but this is because the natural law principles of even how to think have been clouded in their minds. So the positive way to overcome it is obviously grace. Grace can overcome those things. And now virtue, working on virtue, so get, you know, working on every single virtue is very helpful. Um, the going to confession regularly is very helpful because how it forces us to refocus the relationship to our sinful lives. We do not live at a time in the church where you can uh, you can think that it's okay just to have a pious faith sit in your pew and say your rosary. Don't get me wrong, I've promoted the rosary all the time. What I'm saying is, is that you have to be knowledgeable in your faith. You need to study these things to some degree. And this is something that's very important. I find most Catholics are intellectually slothful. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I have a PhD. I'm saying that because of the fact that people need to educate themselves because we don't live at a time where you can have the luxury of just simply following what your priest says. We just don't live there because it's Father Hardy. But we don't have that. We don't have that luxury. Okay. I think we'll stop there. We're going to take a five minute break <clears throat> and then uh, when we come back, we'll have a QA. But before we take our five minutes, and by the way, feel free to have another refreshment or lemonade, restroom with an alcohol. But before we take our five minute break, for those of you who have not received the color envelope, would you kindly raise your hand? Okay, this side. Just raise your hand and keep it up until you get an envelope. All right, very good. Um, we'll see you in five minutes for questions and answers from Father Rickard. Keep your hand up if you have not received an envelope. She's coming. Uh, Yeah, so the question is, is how did the, in the Protestant Revolution, how did they, uh, oh, yeah, there we go. How did they, yeah. how, uh, wait, I might need a different question. How did, How did the Protestant Reformation or Revolution actually result in them getting away from the natural law? And the answer was twofold. One is that the natural law was actually associated with scholasticism in the Catholic Church, and so that was one of the reasons they didn't like it. The other component was the fact that the Protestants were 
the Protestants never had a philosophical background. And so the discussion of natural law is primarily a philosophical one, and as a result of that, because they didn't have it, it was never really adopted or discussed. And in the end, part of it also has to do with the fact that they considered the moral code completely contained within scripture, so you don't need anything else. So that's the primary way that it, I mean, those are the, the principles that resulted in the collapse from them even in their understanding of natural law. Okay, we got next question here. Please keep your questions concise. One of the things, Father, you did not address that seems to be pervasive in our political discussions and in the Supreme Court opinions you talked about, especially with respect to those sodomy cases and fornication cases, it's this idea, the, uh, idea the, the, the harm principle, the idea that if I don't, as long as whatever we do doesn't hurt somebody else, um, then it should be okay and I have, a, I have a right or freedom to do that sort of thing. How does that idea play into the natural law, if at all? And it seems to be pervasive in our culture today as well, especially in political circles, that idea. Uh, I think there's two components to it. Is the natural law dictates, there's actually two kinds of precepts, negative, negative precepts and positive precepts. Negative precepts tell us that you are not to do X. So a negative precept is you shall not steal, right? So part of that would be thou shalt not harm, right? But the shall not harm is actually circumscribed also by the natural law because there could be circumstances under which case, so for example, in cases of legitimate self-defense, you may end up having to kill somebody in order to legitimately defend yourself. So that principle, thou shalt not harm, is not, it's not the overall encompassing thing. The second thing is, it also has to do with the definition of harm. What do you mean by harm? Do you mean by harm causing uh, emotional, psychological, spiritual, formational, or uh, various other kinds of damage to the person? So this is one of the things that I think is not quite understood. So the positive precepts too, it doesn't embrace the positive precepts, which means under certain circumstances, I have an obligation to do certain things. So one of them would be, you know, like I have an obligation if I turn the correct to my brother if he's doing something wrong under certain circumstances, if I know that he's going to take the correction, etc. So there, you can't, uh, you can't just say that this is the only precept, or this is the only thing that we can basically agree in relationship to the civil law, or even the natural, or the uh, moral law, because it doesn't, it's, it's too broad and it doesn't give us enough content, or it doesn't provide enough specificity to determine people's behavior ultimately, because in the end that just means, well, it's up to my judgment, I didn't think I was hurting him. So. Okay, we have two questions in a row, so go ahead and ask both questions. Straight up. My God, yes, our real father, okay? Okay. I'll do it very fast. Okay. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights created and written by the forefathers. Right. Are they based on the natural law? Parts are, parts aren't. Sir? Parts are and parts, parts aren't. Second, socialism and communism, contrary to the natural law, right? Correct. At least in the mind of the 13th. Next question. Father, could you uh, elucidate just a little bit on uh, George Frederick Hegel and the Hegelian dialectic and how that has uh, kind of thwarted this whole idea that progress is always positive? All right. Well, basically, Hegel had this idea that he said you'd start out with the, uh, a thesis, a particular set of series of um, circumstances in world history, and then you would proceed to an antithesis, which is the opposite of the thesis, and then from that arose a, th a synthesis from the two, and then, then that new synthesis became the antithesis, and so human history was constantly changing, and this actually even applied even to things like moral law, religion, etc. By the way, that Hegelian dialectic is actually part of modernist heresy in this sense. You might even have read this in certain theologians, some of them that are very well known, who said that it's not possible for one generation to pass on the tradition intact from one generation to another without introducing something of themselves into it. It was that mindset that drove the modernists uh, to basically completely alter the tradition as we now have it. That was, the, that was the mindset. So in relationship to the natural law, nature, uh, it's kind of interesting. If you read Aristotle's Metaphysics in the Greek, the actual word 
for essence is toti estenena, which basically means it's actually four words, which means that which is to be. And by that, it means that the essences, the natures of things are eternal. They never change. They will never change. Human nature will never change. With the Hegelian dialectic, it's always changing. And so there's this idea that human beings are always progressing towards a better state, right? Uh, I mean, I just don't know how that's even sustainable, given just looking at the general landscape in our culture, things are just completely eroded. I mean, if you say things are better now than they were in the 1950s, I, I mean, I can't help you. Right? So, uh, the, the point being is, is that this Hegelian dialectic is this idea that it's always getting better. It's also the biggest problem because they actually think that we think today modern men are superior to people in the past. They just didn't understand these things, whereas we understand these things. Little did they know about this thing just discovered called genetic entropy. That the genetic mutations in every single generation is cumulative over the course of time, which means we are genetically inferior to our ancestors. That's also true about our brains. Technically speaking, we are dumber than our ancestors. I don't think that's too difficult to prove either. Okay. So the point being is, is that this idea that things are always getting better is simply not true. But it also it's a problem of in relationship to the natural law, it means that morals are going to change, because the nature, human nature is going to change. Which isn't the case, it always remains the same. Okay, next question. So, could you kind of explain to us how the errors of evolution tie into the anti natural law mindset found in today's culture? Actually, that's a, that's a phenomenal question for someone here. <laughs> the idea with evolution is, at least macroevolution, is, is that. Uh, as small changes occur over the course of time, the species change from one thing to another. Right? And aside from the fact that there's no indication in the soft fossil record for it, and the fact that philosophically it's unsustainable, which is what my book is on, uh, the fact of the matter is, is again, that um, uh, I think it's done two things. The first is, is that uh, most people don't know this, but the primary people that got evolution off the ground, the primary thinkers behind it, the intellectuals behind it, were all deists and Freemasons. All of them were deists or Freemasons. Now, a deist is someone who believes that God created the world and then just set it in motion and just let it go. Which basically means he didn't determine the nature of things at all in the process. And so evolution is what counts for the nature of things, but that means that natures are constantly changing, and so, so is the natural, there wouldn't be a natural law, it would just be natures were changing, and so we would just change, we would just act according to our nature now, which usually means we're going to go the way of all flesh, just following the inclinations of original sin. So you got that problem, that's on the side of the deist. On the side of the Freemasons, the idea was to provide an alternative scientific foundation contrary to the scriptures. That was the idea behind it. But it's in, it's in scripture that we see God creating the individual natures and setting them, in, uh, in, in setting them up and establishing them in the, in the process of creation. And so, does microevolution occur? Yes, there can be changes. We see this with fruit flies, right? They show that all the time. But you never see a fruit fly turning into an amoeba or a bat or whatever. The point being is, is that these are just pieces um, that it basically goes back to the whole deist thing of that things are just in motion and that they're developing on their own because God just kind of set it in motion, which means there's no determinate, unchanging nature in anything. And so that's one of the uh, that's one of the problems. If you, if you hear that thing, eventually we will evolve out of our bodies. I'm like, you know, come to Colorado and smoke something more than healthy. You know, you just, what are people thinking? Can you describe, based on past cultures that have been, that, who have accepted, you know, the, the sort of culture that we have of you know, fornication and sexuality? Yeah. And things, can you describe what we might expect um, in, in our culture? In this, it, it, I know it's not sustainable, but can you describe that just a little bit? Well, even if you look at it historically, one of the professors that I had said that if you actually look at the history of the world, every single culture where 
fornication has occurred, the next thing is contraception, and once contraception occurs, then homosexuality, there is a, there is, he said, if you look at it historically, there's a concomitant between the uh, contraception and homosexuality in every single culture that's ever happened. You see this in the Roman Empire, it happened there, the Mayan Empire, once you start killing your children off too, then this is the problem you're gonna have. But that's actually the progression. So once the natural law basically collapsed, and see part of the difficulty is, is the relationship with the natural law is, is we have the luxuries actually studying St. Thomas and actually studying what the church says, who as the church herself says, the church is an expert in the natural law. So that being the case, then we have the, we know we have a highly developed understanding of the structure of the moral law. A lot of these places didn't, but they still have the natural law. That's what St. Paul talks about. But they have the natural law, but sin starts to occur. That's when you study most cultures that were a bad uh, religion is introduced. That's when you start to see, which is the bad intellectual formation, that's when you start to see them go downhill. Are you good for another couple questions, Sean? Sure. Tim, I'm sure Dan, you say something about him. Uh, is, has he had an influence in the church? Is he against the moral law? Or uh, is cosmic Christ and everything's going to get better and better and better? Uh, yeah, he was, he was just the guy that took Hegelianism and merged with evolution and created this system that eventually we're all going to converge into one monistic, one, one entity, one thing, which called the Omega Point. Of course, um, his, uh, he, he was a fraudulent. He actually falsified a archaeological find, it's called Piltdown. He falsified it in order to gain, to give impetus behind the evolutionary theory. But basically he's just an alien just on steroids. So. Okay, next question. Okay, thank you. You uh, brought up a lot of factual information in your presentation, and thank you. And it was a little alarming. And uh, we were very fortunate to have Archbishop Chaput here in Denver for quite a while, and I'm just curious if you had any observations about his views on some of the uh, natural law, or maybe some of your books, rec rec maybe you have some recommendations on, on your books that address some of these issues? The best stuff in the natural law is all in Latin, unfortunately, and it's very old. That's where the real good stuff is. Uh, I, have, I must confess, I haven't read his particular stuff. I mean, Brown Brick bits and pieces of his discussion of natural law, but I haven't actually read any, uh, any work that he, where he goes into in depth on it. Um, there is a couple of books out there. Um, actually, the Natural Law Center probably has stuff that they can recommend. Online, go to the library, and we do recommend some books. Yeah. Not all the good books, but there's a, uh, many good books. Uh, mostly metaphysical books, books on as Father was saying, uh, uh, common sense realism, certainly we have those ethics and some other classics. But not all, it's not a complete list, but it's a good list. Center for Natural Law, go to the library. Very good, two more questions. Here's one. Hi, my, my question is if you have any advice on how to cultivate the virtue of studiosity as opposed to advice on curiosity. As a student, I think it's important not just uh, it's first about the curiosity. You have to severely limit your access to media. Because, and here's why. Not because it's evil. I'm not a Luddite. You know, I don't buy that. It's good. But it's like anything else. You, know, you drink too much alcohol, you're going to have a problem, right? But, but the, problem, the problem with the media, the way it's structured now, especially the internet, is it feed, constantly feeds you information. It's all factual, by your data. It's not stuff that's going to develop in your intellectual habits, generally speaking. I mean, to, to, to develop the virtue of studiosity basically means you have to put your nose to the grindstone, and that means that you have to put certain things aside. And as a virtue, you're going to have to set time aside time every day when you're doing some reading. And you should start with, you know, things about your faith, etc. If you're really good at philosophy, you can be reading some philosophy. But it really just boils down to setting the time aside each day and actually doing reading, um, which is the way to. Uh, to make actually about the virtues, like the other virtues, you just have to do it over and over again. So, and it requires discipline, right? Some of it is just getting the motivation for it. You know, I, I don't know, maybe this is just because of the way I grew up, but the idea of, I mean, maybe it was because I was around my brother, so whenever he was doing something like, I don't know what he's doing, how he's doing it, how does he understand it? But, you know, 
when I went to the seminary, if there was an area in the philosophy or theology that I didn't know, I went and got the books, read St. Thomas or whoever, and read the books to fill in my gaps in my knowledge. We have a natural desire to know that can be eclipsed by constantly feeding us things that like that feed the curiosity. 98, 95% of what most people read on the internet, they don't need to be reading that on the internet. You know, they don't really need to know that stuff on the internet. But at the same time, uh, and so a lot of, I think, what the media is feeding is curiosity, which is contrary to that. Whereas curiosity is actually the development of the intellectual virtues, and so you gotta put that stuff aside and actually parse out, okay, where do I need to go from here to, to, uh, to learn more? The Catholic Church actually has always said that every Catholic has an obligation to continue educating themselves according to their state of life. Most Catholics, why? Why don't they have this desire to know their Catholic faith? Because they're just satisfied they're sitting in the pew. That's it. Rather than, which is really what? That means in bad habits, as St. Thomas says, or through malformation, they're just not interested in pursuing it, and they need to respark that by start reading about it in areas that they're interested in. Okay, this could be the last question. Uh, how, how would you uh, how, how would you discern a natural law of inclination uh, like the first command without recourse to religion? How would someone just understand that? Without recourse to religion? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's rather lengthy, but St. Thomas actually does it, right? So in other words, we have these, the, the, the natural inclination, part of it, there's two parts of religion. Part of it is the reasoning process, which Part of the large part is just observation, right? We know that we have a natural desire to be happy, to be perfectly happy. What is that perfect happiness consistent? Well, it consists in either contemplation or a life of virtue. But then on top of that, then of course the church says, well actually there's a perfect beatitude which is even above that, so we can learn about that. But we know, and it's very interesting because if you read Aristotle in, uh, not the Nicomachean Ethics, but the other one, he actually says, it seems, it seems, that given the way that we have happiness and contemplation, that the final end of man would seem to be a never-ending contemplation of the unmoved mover, which is the beatific vision, essentially. But then he says, but such a life is too high for man. Okay, so what does this mean? He's just observing about what we take joy in, and uh, the observation about what we're naturally inclined towards, we know that people are inclined towards marriage. We know that people are, uh, you know, you just you can see it. We know people are inclined towards having children. And so the, over the course of time, the moralists have, uh, you know, categorized these things in those three categories, natural inclination, and they say these individual things fall within these categories. And so you can actually see that what? We have a natural inclination. It's occluded in most people's lives. It's plowed in most people's lives. But we have a natural inclination to actually want to worship God. You can see this in young people who are getting nothing. But once they see the beauty of the Catholic Mass, there's an attraction that they naturally have. Or when they see people praying, or they see somebody, um, you know, performing acts of sacrifice for God or what have you, there's a natural attraction that we have in relationship to wanting to see that, be part of it, etc. So it's basically it's an observation process that they've done over centuries. And all this actually started, you know, with the uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Greek philosophers, basically, were the ones who really first started, the Roman philosophers, really started discussing is there's this natural law, what is it? And, and it took a long time. It wasn't until the church came along that we actually, God told us, this is the structure, and then we can go back and actually see, okay, now we can see it in read, we can actually see how this is the case, and you can reason to it without actually having to appeal to Revelation. Okay, Father, my apologies. This is the last, last question. Okay. <laughs> Father, can it be argued that Morris Letitia is an example of a collapse of natural law in the church? There's always going to be somebody who that. <laughs> if you take the interpretation that is being given to it, generally speaking, I'm putting aside what the Holy Father intended is. Ultimately, I'm sure you've heard that thing, there's only three things that, there's three things that even God doesn't know, and one of them is what's in a Jesuit's mind. But, um, <laughs> but, so putting aside that, the common interpretation is, in fact, that very thing. That we've seen a collapse 
in relationship to it. And actually, you know, some of the some of the uh, European authors are actually drawing attention to this. This is actually a rejection of John Paul II's discussion of the natural law in various documents, just, just since that, just since John Paul II, right? And even the discussion of the natural law. So to answer your question, yeah, I think it is the product of the collapse of the natural law in seminary formations, especially. So, okay. Let's give Father a powerful. <laughs> Thank you all. Be careful. We'll see you next time. Love you all. Thank you for your support.